we could start with actual introductions. Um, I'll go ahead. So my name is Lara Ho. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I work for the International Rescue Committee and I'm one of the co-chairs for the Health and Nutrition Work Group. And I'll hand it over to Stephanie. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Vasquez. Um, work for, for Vixel, uh, communications and technology, small business. Um, and I'm also a co-chair of the Health and Nutrition Working Group with CW. I forgot to add, I was going to say each person, maybe could, if you could tell us how you got involved in SID or how you heard about this. And I can say that um, it was one of my business development colleagues who's uh, who actually works on USG uh, partnerships um, was the one who connected me to, to SID and encouraged me to get involved in the work group. Um, I can follow Laura. Um, yeah, so I'm, I guess, a year into my, my co-chair position here. And um, again, yeah, similar to, to Laura, a colleague had mentioned that they were, um, you know, looking for new co-chairs and, you know, recognizing that I, that I had a health background and this, this would be something of interest. Um, and, and yeah, and so I got connected to CW and now have the opportunity to serve as, as a co-chair uh, for this work group. Uh, Paul, do you and the staff want to go ahead briefly introduce yourself? Maybe we should let everybody else introduce themselves okay. and then we can go at the end. Okay, sounds good. Um, I'll just go down, uh, if you if we can just go down the list then. Um, Alexandria? People can just go ahead and introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Alexandria Schmall and I'm the nutrition lead with CNFA, a DC based international NGO that focuses on improving agriculture and livelihoods through market systems and agricultural development initiatives. And this is my first meeting with the working group today. Thanks, welcome. Um, Allison? Hi, my name is Allison Clausing and I am the program and data um, nutrition specialist at Opportunity International. Um, I am located actually in Chicago. This is my first meeting. Um, and a colleague that is located in DC um, working with USG partnerships let me know about this. So I'm really excited. Okay, thanks. Uh, Andrea? Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Edmond. Um, I also work at the International Rescue Committee with Lara um, and I am the Advocacy and Communications Specialist for the IWOG Newborn Initiative. Um, this is my first meeting as well. Lara passed it along and I was really interested in hearing more about the youth advocacy event um, and the planning around that. So excited to meet everyone. Thanks, uh, Matthew. Hello, my name is Matthew Zink. I um, am with CRDF Global and I support our global health uh, business development efforts and um, our organization recently joined SID in, in the past year and so I'm kind of our global health representative uh, for SID. So this is my first meeting, so uh, very excited to be here. Thanks, and your name Geda? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Yenengida Kasaum, but I go by Abby, so to make it easy for you. Um, I'm actually a DRPH candidate at uh, London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. I just recently moved into the Washington, D.C. area. So currently, I'm just affiliated with the National Academy of Science as a peer reviewer on a COVID-19 response and uh, with Africa CDC. And uh, yeah, my uh, goal is hopefully to network and see uh, what is happening actually in this area. That's all. Okay, do we have anyone else who's not staff who hasn't introduced themselves? I don't believe so. Okay, uh, so yeah, Paul, if you wanna go ahead. Yeah, um, I guess I'll start for the team and I'll pass it along to everybody else. Uh, Paul Sherman, I'm the director of programs for CIDW, so I help manage all the programs that we're doing. Uh, obvious, and obviously the work group being a very big chunk of that. Uh, so here to answer any questions as they come up and I'll pass it over to the rest of my colleagues, uh, starting with Pebbles. Hi everyone, this is Pebbles, guys. I'm the one behind the Sid main um, account. So unfortunately my name is not up on screen, um, but I am the membership and external affairs manager with Sid. So mainly I'm here today to support you any technical help as needed, um, but I'm also just really excited to hear the conversation. 
Um, I'll pass it to Melina. Hi everyone, my name is Melina Reynoso. I'm with Sid Washington as one of the program associates and I use she, her pronouns like everyone else on staff here. I'm just here to help support. And again, I'm really excited to see what you all will bring up. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it to Jamal. Hey everyone, I'm Jamal. I'm the events and administration coordinator at Sid. And like everyone said, I'm just here to support and listen to the conversation. And I'll pass it to Vivian. Um, hi everyone, my name is Vivian. I'm also a program associate with Sid. Um, also here for support and just very intrigued about learning this uh, work group as well. I think that's everyone from Sid. Great, thank you. Um, so I've put off the agenda for today. We finished the introductions. I'm gonna give a brief review of what we've done in the past year, and then we'll start talking a little bit about planning and events for next year. We can, we had a few people fill out the survey so we can talk a little bit about that. And then there's a final agenda item about co-chair recruitment because I my term as co-chair will be ending in July. So um, apologies for those of you who have attended events and already know about these, but I wanted to sort of give you a sense of what uh, the work group does. It's, it's quite open to what we, choose to do. We're expected to organize a few events um, and they can be in different formats. What we found that has been sort of what people have been interested in the most is different technical topics um, and sharing learning and things like that. So last year we did an event uh, in collaboration with the education work group that was focused on the nurturing care framework, so early childhood development. And it was a panel session. So I think we had an opening speaker and then we had three panelists, one from USAID, one from IRC, who talked more about the humanitarian setting sort of, and then someone from PATH who talked about integration of ECD within health programs and more development settings. And the USAID talked a little bit more about the m &E and sort of um, how we're moving the nursing care framework ahead. That was supposed to be an in-person event, but because of COVID ended up being online. So it was our first online event. Subsequently, we've done, we've gotten uh, more used to doing the online events. Uh, so we did another collaboration. This was with the Environment and Sustainability Work Group. Um, we originally had been interested in talking about climate change, but in the end, ended up uh, organizing an event around mitigating poor urban sanitation and health impacts. Uh, and you know, since we had this opportunity with doing the event online, it was nice because Typically our in-person events are you know, in DC, so it's, we have to get speakers who are already in DC because we don't really have a budget to bring people in. Um, but this was, uh, because we knew it was gonna be an online event, we were able to plan it and have people from across the world. So we had different speakers um, from a variety of organizations, uh, partners, local organizations to talk about uh, their work. And we had opening speaker from the World Bank who sort of off moderated uh, this, who'd been, who's done some work on sort of developing a lot of frameworks for urban sanitation. Uh, and then we had someone from WHO, yeah, someone from an NGO, and I think possibly someone from the city, I don't remember exactly the, the last one. It was more or less a traditional panel and sort of discussion. Uh, then we had another joint <laughs> uh, session that was with the monitoring and evaluation work group. So we decided to focus on how COVID had impacted monitoring and evaluation and um, ways that people had had to adjust and sort of best practices used for trying to figure out how to deal with uh, continuing to do monitoring evaluation in light of the pandemic where there are a lot of constraints with travel and things like that. And so we had an opening speaker from USAID and then what we did is actually lightning talks, which were much shorter. I think each person had about two minutes. Um, and we had really a very wide variety of people who did MEL across pretty much all different sectors. Um, so people from, from health, from governance, from peace building, protection, things like that. Um, and it was nice to have a really broad range of student speakers. Again, we got people from all over the world. They gave very, very quick snippets of, um, you know, either a lesson learned or an example, a case that they, they had of how they adapted their m and &E. And then the moderator did some, some Q and A and some discussion with each of them. So that was sort of a nice, different way to present a panel event um, with the lightning talks. And then 
this event actually hasn't happened yet. <laughs> it's our next event. Um, again, we were approached by the Youth and Development Work Group who wanted to do something on um, youth advocacy to advance family planning. So this is coming up very soon. We have a great panel of three youth activists, uh, a moderator who works with youth, youth ad advocates from Pathfinder and, um, and a brief opening speaker who'll talk a little bit about the, the needs for family planning for adolescents and youth. And so excited to hear about um, different youth and their work that they've done again across different um, geographies uh, for family planning. So that's sort of where we are with what we've done and are about to do. And I think um, we, I'll hand it over to Stephanie who's going to talk a little bit about planning for next year. Great. Thank, thanks, Laura. Um, the only thing I just wanted to just to, to add, just, you know, um, having worked on a few of those events over the last year, you know, one of the benefits of working on these events is working with other work groups. Um, as you can see, I think almost all, I think, of our events really were a joint collaboration with other Sid Washington work groups. Um, and so as we kind of think sort of forward looking, you know, thinking through sort of the priorities around global health and nutrition, if there's opportunities um, to integrate with other work groups, that's something we might want to keep in mind. Also in a, in a COVID environment, um, I, I think one of the benefits that it's brought to us, um, you know, unfortunately we're all online all the time, but it has given us more accessibility to field representation, to be part of our, our webinars. Um, and so I think that was a nice benefit in the, many of the webinars we planned last year was really how can we get people that are in the field to be part of the conversation. So it's not just um, staff based in the DC area to be part of part of these discussions. And so also thinking forward as well, um, how do we want to integrate field-based perspectives? Um, you know, we're, it's unclear sort of what's gonna happen over the next six months to a year, if we'll still remain kind of in this, um, in this environment, um, we may not be able to meet in person. So we might wanna continue to take advantage of what it offers in terms of bringing in that field-based perspective. Um, and so thinking through sort of what are the priorities we want to think about in terms of events for the next year, I thought we could make this a, a more collaborative and so I put a link um, in the chat. So if you want to just take a click on it, I'm not, I'm not sure if I can take control Laura, or if you can click on it. Um, and that will take us to the Jamboard. And it'll just be an opportunity for us to, just to talk in, informally in terms of sort of what are we think our priorities are in terms of key topics that we would want to um, bring to this platform. You know, CW has such a, a broad audience that it's such a great opportunity to think through sort of what are areas that we're interested in highlighting that may not be touched in other forums um, or there are different perspectives we wanna offer. Um, so kind of pulling from the survey, unfortunately our survey, we didn't get a lot of feedback. We got seven responses from that survey. Um, but in that survey, it's clear people are really interested in, in networking and really kind of sharing best practices um, and so how can we kind of continue in those themes and thinking through sort of what are the topics we want to think about for the next year and then think through sort of those formats um, that we could think about whether it's webinar or maybe some non-traditional formats as well. Um, the Jamboard, if, if you have any issues with it, um, it, it should be pretty easy in terms of being able to click, um, I think you're, you're controlling this, right, Laura? Let me, I will click on mine uh yeah you can go you can you it should show up if you start adding stuff okay right? i'm just sharing my screen okay perfect so let me click on the jam board um and i thought we could just take a few minutes just to think through sort of you know what are some of the key topics we want to consider in the next year um and i'll just open mine you and might I need to change I'm looking at it, it says view only, so I'm not sure I can actually add things. I don't know if that's the case for everyone else that they they can only view. Oh, is no one share an editable link. Has anyone else been able to get in? Let me just do a quick test. I can add stuff. Yeah, it's view only. It's only view only, okay. So let me see if I can change it. It's I think when you click on the share, you just have to change the setting to editors. Ah, here we go. Oh, okay. Let me go with editors, editors. Okay. Okay. Does it work now? Let me know if you're able to add to it. 
Yeah, that works. Okay, perfect. So we can just focus on the left side of, of the Jamboard, sort of thinking through topics of interest. Um, and again, pulling from the survey, um, we received two areas that um, from, from the respondents. One was sort of on focusing on market systems to improve um, nutrition in middle low income countries. And the second was more general in terms of how we can think about issues related to global um, public health and related to public man to, related to project management and, and business development trends. Um, so maybe if I want to just take a few minutes now that you guys can add stuff, feel free to add form or we or feel free to, to, to talk. I can also add things as well. If there's areas that we want to um, think about in this next year, obviously I think COVID is something that's front and center in many of our in our work and, and you know many of our conversations. Um, but if there's different ways we want to think about COVID in this next year, um, I think there's opportunities to kind of frame the conversations in a unique way. Okay. And just if you haven't used Jamboard, um, so if you can see on the screen, you can just click on this sticky note if you're on the, the panel on the left and it gives you a sticky note. And if you type, like if you just type in a test um, and save, it'll, whoops, it'll put the, the sticky note there and then you can move the sticky note around. You can make it bigger or smaller like this stuff. But yeah, I'll delete that one. Or, or feel free if you want to just, um... Yeah, you can say it. I'm, I'm happy to type it in as well. You know, if there's ideas that people have in terms of what are some of the events we want to think about, um, or just topics. It doesn't have to be events, but just sort of areas that we know um, maybe aren't traditionally discussed, or things that we want to think about in a different way. Maybe um, just kind of building off what you were saying, Stephanie, of of COVID being front and center. I know that. Um, have seen some kind of calls for new financing mechanisms related to um, pandemic uh, uh, preparedness and kind of resilience and kind of whatever buzzwords you want to use. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so I, I don't I don't know if that's something that would fall into the category where others aren't also focusing on it. But um, I think could be an interesting avenue of of, of how to help influence that conversation if it's if it is of interest yeah i think there's a lot around COVID, right um sort of the financing piece the vaccine piece in particular um and sort of being the health and nutrition work group i mean this is an opportunity to kind of think through how we want to frame those conversations i see someone else put in sort of the impact of COVID 19 in the health systems and and lower in lmic countries does someone want to expand on that in terms of sort of what kind of angle they might be thinking? Ah, oh, this is interesting. The link between COVID-19 and climate change. Sorry, um, I think you uh, asked about the COVID comment. Yeah, if you wanted to expand on um, your sticky note here and the impact of COVID-19 on health systems. Yeah, so yeah. at least from my understanding and just uh, scanning the environment, it looks like, um, I guess, uh, COVID had uh, disrupted a lot of the uh, healthcare systems, uh, particularly in uh, low and middle income countries or particularly low uh, income countries. Uh, for example, in uh, the attention that used to be given to maternal and newborn healthcare uh, had been severely curtailed, I think, in a lot of countries. Uh, but that also goes uh, for malaria or other uh, tropical conditions. Um, this is just looking at communicable diseases, obviously, but it also has a huge impact on non-communicable diseases in uh, uh, middle-income countries. And I think uh, there are a lot of studies coming out of India, for example, that have shown um, the devastating impact COVID had on uh, health provision for non-communicable diseases as well. So. I mean, obviously, um, still right now, people we're all trying to figure out exactly uh, how it impacted, but I think that deserves a lot of attention, basically, and um, how can I say, uh, coming back to <laughs> post-COVID levels or even improving them better, actually. Yeah, yeah there's a lot there. 
And are you currently, it sounds like you're also involved in COVID-19 research? Um, I am. Um, so my particular involvement right now is actually giving advice to or commenting on uh, recommendations that are uh, provided to CDC uh, Africa, but uh, focusing on specific countries. Um, so right now, one of the initiatives is basically every uh, month, there would be a focus on three or four countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and how to go about implementing uh, basically non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions for COVID. So which means basically focusing on, um, uh, how can I say, <laughs> more uh, on um, modifying social behavior and uh, some of our uh, public engagement. And then of course the um, economic or how to uh, better support people basically for the economic fallouts. Um, so these are population-based approaches uh, for most of these countries. Um, also, I guess it attaches a bit on um, some of these um, uh, negative impacts on the health systems. Right. No, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm seeing sort of this little cluster here of, of COVID-19 related themes, um, and especially the one related to climate change, because I feel like that also aligns nicely to um, the Biden administration is also investing more heavily in climate change. So there might be an opportunity here for us to, to think about, you know, how we might want to look at COVID-19 through a climate change lens. But someone's thanks for organizing. I was kind of clustering them as well. So um, there's a, a few here around sort of health systems related. Um, I don't know if anyone kind of speaks to sort of what their, their thoughts here on strengthening the health system for UHC and global health security. Yeah, I added that one in, and um, this is also kind of uh, something that my organization has been trying to think through. And just so for context. Um, CRDF Global, we definitely come in more at the global health security angle. Um, but also, I think, again, kind of with COVID-19 and moving forward, trying to kind of shift the conversation away from these, you know, being two separate things, but rather working, um, you know, in parallel and uh, kind of having a unified approach rather than just thinking one versus the other. Right. And there's also this preparing for the next global pandemic. That's an actually interesting extension too, right? So it's not just COVID next team, but what, what's going to come next could be another topic that we consider. Yeah, I, I put that one in there. Um, normally, I don't provide commentary on event ideas for words, but I felt like you know I was just making connections because this is something we we're talking about potentially at the annual conference too. Um, perhaps there might be. I mean, Jamal is the expert on what exactly we're talking about the conference, but I think there's some connections that I can see with some of the topics that are being thrown around, at least for some parts of it, like the table, the uh, round table discussions that we're having. So I figured it'd be a nice little connection. Yeah. And, and Paul, while I have you, um, in terms of sort of as we think through sort of the topics of the events and sort of the format of events, I'm assuming we're just going to be virtual at least for the next six months. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, I, I'd say virtual through the end of the year at the very least, maybe a little bit longer, we'll see. Um, we are, that's actually a question we're thinking about at higher levels than the organization. So uh, we're trying to figure out what the best move is uh, from a safety standpoint, but also from, for all of you, obviously we wanna see everybody in person as opposed to being on Zoom calls all the time. So, um, but sorry, long story short is yes, at least the, at least through the end of the year. Okay, well that, that's helpful just in terms of sort of planning this through. And so um, it, it seems like there's obviously a great interest around COVID-19, um, you know, systems related issues, tools, tools and best practices. Um, you know, if, if there is some interest of work on a COVID-19 panel, 
um, you know, we can come together and think through sort of what that panel would look like, thinking through, you know, what do we want to accomplish? What's our objective? Do we want to partner with another working group? You know, if we want to think about climate change, for example, and sort of that intersection, um, or even um, the agriculture section. I saw there's someone mentioned about food systems. Um, so there's opportunities for us to, to kind of take this beyond um, initial ideas, but how do we want to translate that into actual events that will we can program over the next year. And Stephanie, this is Alexandria. Just to add on the, um, the ag and food system side, there is the UN Food System Summit, which is coming up later this year in September. And it's this major event within global food systems and nutrition. Um, and I know that they're hosting a lot of online dialogues um, in relation to some of the summit themes. So it could be a nice opportunity to, you know, work with some of the other working groups within SID, but then also to capitalize on this, you know, larger global interest in these types of topics. Um, so if there was interest in hosting, you know, as SID and then broadcasting out to a wider group, um, I'm sure we'd get a lot of interest in that. And when is that event scheduled? Um, the summit itself is in September, but the uh, dialogues, which are these online webinars that different uh, civil society groups, governments, NGOs, um, and other organizations, those are taking place from now until August. Um, and anyone can organize them. So if we were interested in you know, linking up with um, the, the UN Food System Summit, uh, we could reach out to them and just say, we'd like to co-host an event. Um, but I know that there are um, there's a lot of demand for um, hosting something in partnership with that summit. Okay. Um, but we're involved in that at CNFA, um, so I'm happy to also, you know, make any connections that would be useful. Yeah, I mean, this is something, I, I believe there is an agriculture working group, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, food security and agriculture. Yeah. Okay. So this could be a topic that we might want to think about bringing forward with them. Um, and in terms of kind of, sorry, now COVID-19, I feel like dominates all our conversations, but um, is there interest, I mean, obviously there's interest around COVID-19. Um, is there anyone on the call who'd be interested? I mean, uh, the co-chairs are involved in sort of the planning of it, but we also want to rely on our work group members to either help or present at these events. Um, and so once we get a topic a bit more, um, more narrow, you know, if there's a particular interest to help with the events, we're more than happy to sort of, you know, invite you to be part of the planning process, or if you'd like to speak at the events, then we can try to think through how we want to frame these conversations as well. Okay. Go ahead. I'm not sure if someone wanted to say something. Uh, was that a question? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to know if, if people are interested in participating and helping with, with the planning of these events. You know, we're, we're more than, than open to, to work with, with members in the work group. Um, and then as we think through sort of the events themselves, you know, we also want to draw on the membership as well in terms of um, presentations in these, in these meetings going forward. Okay, personally, I'll be uh, interested definitely to help out with the planning if you wanna put me down. I don't know um, if there was a different way of actually uh, capturing this. But. Yeah, I mean, what we could do is if COVID-19 is an area of interest then we could just have like a smaller discussion around um, how do we wanna narrow the theme of COVID-19? Cause I think there's a lot of different sides to it. Um, I think we just have to be a little bit more targeted in terms of what do we want to achieve and how do we want to make a, make ourselves a differentiator against all the other COVID-19 webinars that we may come across. Um, and that would, what would be the most relevant topics that we would want to highlight in these meetings. And I guess, Paul, do we have contact information for people so that we can follow up afterwards or should people drop their emails in the chat? Um, I can, yes, I can send you the, the information. I can send you that information, but yeah, they, yeah, and if you feel either way, you can put it in the chat as well. Okay. Thanks. And, and I was just going to say, I mean, also generally interested, um, 
you know, pending when exactly and kind of availability, at least for planning, uh, you know, for speaking at any events, I don't, I don't think I would be equipped to do that, but can certainly pending what the theme is, you know, see if there are any of our uh, technical advisors or other staff that uh, would be relevant. Okay, yeah, if you could just drop your, your name in the chat, just to be helpful um, to kind of keep that in the notes. So as we kind of think through events, we know sort of who to reach out to. Okay, yeah, so if you're interested in supporting any kind of planning, please feel free to, to drop an email in the chat and, and we can kind of continue the conversation after this, um, after this webinar. And then in terms of sort of how do we want to structure the format of our events, you know, as, as Laura mentioned, the majority of our events have been webinars. Um, and and it's, it works well, you know, um, in this environment, we're able to get a large audience. But if there's other ways we want to think about how we bring together in this virtual environment, um, either using social media, for example, um, I don't know, virtual happy hours, someone mentioned happy hours as, as a way of, of bringing people together. Um, or other types of format structures we might want to consider that might be a bit more informal. Um, we can also think about that in the next year. And if you have other ideas in terms or other events you've seen that have worked really well in terms of creating that engagement, um, you know, and, and sort of it's in a different format rather than just, you know, death by PowerPoint that many of us experience. And so I feel like most people prefer the, the webinar format. Is there another format that anyone else would, would want to suggest or recommend outside of the webinar format? I think the webinar is really helpful, especially if it's um, a bit stronger on the breakout rooms, like you said, where we all sit through you know, webinars all day um, or give them all day. So I think if it was like light on the whole, like teaching people something um, mm -hmm. and larger um, focus on the breakout rooms, I think that would be really helpful. And I think, sorry, Paul, not to pick up the spot again, but we have that facility, right? Through the, the current platform that we use that we could do breakout rooms? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, some of the better webinars I've been to have had interactive things like where there's polls or using things like Mentimeter and other tools that engage people to actually participate, which some of it depends on how large the group you have um, is, but uh, those are things that I found help break up the monotony of people just talking at you. Yeah, I must say, I, I did like the lightning format that we did where there were no PowerPoints um, and everyone, all the speakers had five minutes of conversation or five minutes to, to talk about their topic and then a, a, a moderated uh, discussion at the end. And that was, is engaging, you know, since you weren't necessarily having to sit by and, and review the PowerPoints, but you could really part or witness the conversation that was taking place. Yeah, I think they only had two minutes, actually. They were very short, right? Oh, was it two minutes? Okay, yeah. So we had to like get to the point. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like webinars continue sort of to be sort of the main method or approach for for these events. I don't think we can do happy hours quite yet, um, unless we want to do like a virtual happy hour, which sometimes can be, I don't know, I've, I've had some good experience and bad experiences, um, you know, through some of these these formats. Um, networking, I know people are interested in doing so again, if, if anyone has any creative ideas of how best to network. Um, you know, in this virtual environment, it gets a little bit more challenging since we, we can't do that one on one conversation. But if there's approaches you've seen that have been really successful when it comes to networking, definitely we're more than open to, to considering that as well. So in terms of um, next steps, then if I'll check the chat, let me see who put their name in there and we'll, we'll continue to follow conversation around um, COVID-19, you know, if there's interest um, also around the agriculture sector as well and sort of what the intersections would be and seeing if we can continue sort of those discussions um, and planning for events in the next year. So I think we have probably two, two events we might wanna think about in this next year. 
Um, and then just to kind of wrap up, the, the final thing we wanted to mention is, you know, Laura is stepping down as, as co-chair, so we do have an opening for the next year. Um, so if you or your colleagues, you know, are interested in, in being part of this network, um, it's really an opportunity to really engage with many other um, businesses, organizations, academia in the health and nutrition space um, and to, and to yeah, to think through sort of what are some of the areas that we want to promote through this platform. Um, so please feel free to step up. Um, you can reach out to, to me, to Paul, and to other people at CW if, if you're interested in, in being, being a co-chair in the next year. Yeah, and we just wanted to give time if people have questions about the role, um, since Paul's here and obviously Stephanie and I here, um, if you have any questions about the role, we're happy to answer them now. And or, like you said, or you can message us later. Paul, do you want to maybe say a couple words on the process of how that works? Yeah, so uh, for the process, it's it's all on our website. I can post the link in the chat, uh, but it's mostly it's really just send a resume, cover letter explaining you know what your you know your interest in the position, and a two references. And then we review the applications, set up calls with the uh, with those we uh, are interested in, and then we make a decision. So it's pretty. That's the breakdown of how it works generally. Um, but as you know, so we'll we, we'll try to get through it in as, as timely a manner as possible. As uh, Laura said, the position will open in probably sometime early summer. Uh, before Lara steps down. So hopefully that there's a little bit of overlap with Lara and as, as, I mean, obviously as well as Stephanie being there as well. So um, that's generally what we're looking at. Uh, so we're, we'll hope, we're hoping to get that underway. But again, as Stephanie said, sorry, as Lara said, is, if you have any questions about uh, the position, feel free to just let me know or reach out to me. Uh, I can put my email in the chat as well. And it really is, it's, I mean, for me, it's been a great opportunity uh, working with the other work groups and sort of, uh, I've enjoyed getting to know the different people who are uh, chairing the other groups and uh, organizing the events around that, so. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even if you think about topics after this call, I mean, please feel free to reach out. I think we're always open to hearing, you know, ideas or ways that we can position events, um, you know, around health and nutrition. So please feel free to reach out. If there's there's things that come up, um, we're more than happy to, to work and collaborate on those topics. Great. So I think just, yeah, the next step is um, we'll, I see some emails in the chat so we can start a follow-up chat afterwards and, and sort of think through these events and thinking through structure and timing um, and how we can get moving on, on these activities in the next year. And, and hopefully, maybe we'll be in person at some point, but it's, it's hard to say at this point. Are there any final questions from anyone or comments? How often are the these types of meetings? The business planning meetings? Yeah, mm -hmm. I believe it's once a year is where- Oh, I this type of meeting only happens once a year? Yeah. Okay, so then yeah, I mean, um, we can have more meetings. We've just typically only done one big meeting, but I mean, that's okay. something that's flexible. Like we can do as many different activities or events as we want, but at a minimum, we do an annual business planning meeting. Yeah, so as, as Laura and Stephanie said, it, we do one of these per year. This is one of, each work group is required to host three events a year. And this, um, this is honestly mostly related to Sid W staff capacity. Because we're a really small team, we're only a six-person staff. You, by just you know, the three staff members are on this call. You've met half of the staff, so we're just really small. And there's you know there are 15 other work groups, and we have two professional networks that essentially act as work groups that are more focused on professional development skill on skill building those types of things. So we're just limited in that stick from that standpoint. So we can only do so much. And, you know, we want to make sure each work group also, each other, like other work groups have the opportunity to host their own events too, plus all the member only events that we do, 
plus the annual events that we do like the conference. So we're limited in that from that standpoint. Hence why it's only three. We'd love and as we love for our workers to do more, but our heads were just explode. That's just way too much work for us um, to do more than just it's just a lot for us to handle. Um, so um, you know, so I just say from that standpoint, like just keep keep that in mind. But that that being said, as Laura also said, we can still do more. It will just largely depend on the other work groups and what's going on. Um, so we might not, if, if say you've already done two events, uh, if health and nutrition's already done two events, we're going to have to wait and see on the other work groups first before we get to a request from the worker. So that's just something we have to factor in. Two things. Yeah, I mean yeah, we can even structure this as a six month, you know, um, so it's not too heavy of a lift, if that seems to be a more reasonable time frame. Yeah, yeah, it just really, again, is going to depend on when we have what other events are going on. It's really kind of more dependent on what's coming out of the pipeline and what happens to fall when, because we're even getting, we get a lot of requests from me our members that want to do events. So it just kind of really just dependent upon that. I can't, like, it's hard for me even to predict like even a month, a month and a half. Well, I can predict like maybe two months out at most. Six is kind of tricky just because I don't know what's coming up. Right. Right, but we can have informal meetings. Like when we're planning an event, you know, like me, like the event that I'm planning on the family planning thing, we've had like five meetings that are just, you know, sort of small planning meetings. So, but this is like in terms of Paul's talking about sort of the official events that are, you know, large and organized in a, well, in a way like this. But if there's, you know, informal conversations and things, those, we have like Stephanie and I meet on the side to just talk about planning and things like that. That, so on that point, we are actually, because we know all of you want to connect in the in between events, obviously, right? Like and networking is really hard right now. It's not easy. One thing we are trying to do, and we're trying to pilot this with another work group when I have uh, to get around to looking at finalizing everything is we're trying, is we're trying to revitalize our, our LinkedIn groups for the work groups. We used to have them. Um, we phased them out of five years ago because they, you know, so, some were active, some weren't. There was just varying degrees of level of activity. Um, so, we're, but we're trying to bring them back, uh, and we're, you know, we just need to work out, you know, basic guidelines and what, you know, what, i.e., what are you, what, what is okay to post, what is not okay to post, those types of things. Um, so, once we've piloted it with another, with another work group, and it's, we think it's fully functional, operational, and we can, you know, launch it across all of our work groups, and that's hopefully something that we could bring back, and hopefully to Stephanie, your point, sorry, to, sorry, Laura, to your point, we can kind of bring back all like that, like in between the conversation in between events, um, and we're not so beholden to having events all the time to actually talk to each other. Great, thanks. Yeah. How many people are active in this um, working group, the health and nutrition specific one? So it, we're working on creating systems to be able to track that information more. Um, our website's a little wonky. We're working on that. Um, there are, as of right now, I believe about 1,500 people on the 1,500 emails on the list on the email list. Yeah. Um, it's hard. I don't know how many of those are active. How many? How many are versus aren't active? Um, that's about the closest I can tell you right now, um, unfortunately, but it's something we're trying to work on. Is there, is there been any thought, Paul, on like a distribution list? Um, that's kind of what the LinkedIn group is supposed to do, essentially. It's supposed to kind of be that as well. So trying to be kind of like a couple different things. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's like so many people, right? And so how do you kind of keep communication flowing for different reasons, either for just disseminating information or for exchange of information or networking? And maybe we could send out the LinkedIn group because I don't even think I have that, Paul. I, I'll look at that. No, I'm, I'm saying we haven't done it yet. Um, okay. I haven't even done the pilot yet. So we need to do the pilot first to make sure it actually works. And like, it's the what we think it should be. We just need to make sure we try it and make sure we've thought through everything and then expand it across all the work groups. So we're still um, working on that. I need to tell all co-chairs about it, but we're still, uh, well, uh, most co-chairs, I think, no, but we want, I want to make sure it's done like the best to our ability before we actually start expanding it. Okay. 
outside right. of just one. No, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Take some time. So but hopefully that's not too far on the horizon. That's like maybe within the next, I don't, I don't know, maybe next three to six months, hopefully earlier than that. Well, let's keep the conversation going around, around COVID-19. I mean, I, I think there's some potential topics here that we just explored today. We can continue sort of talking it through in terms of how we want to frame those conversations. Um, and then we probably want to reach out to the agriculture and food security working group. You know, um, that's another opportunity for collaboration in the future. So I think there's there's two items and, and then, yeah, thinking through sort of networking as Paul sort of thinks through larger systems that could be helpful um, for larger networking. And do we have your emails, um, Stephanie and Laura? I know that Paul shared his. I can share mine. I'll put mine in the chat. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Make sure it's to everyone. There you go. Yeah. So I think Laura put hers in the chat. I put ours in the chat. So. Well, thank you everyone. We appreciate your time. Um, and yeah, let's kind of keep the conversation going and look, I'm excited to, to meet everyone. And again, you know, the, the doors open for any other topics or events that you feel we want to use this platform for. I think it's, it's a really great opportunity to really sort of highlight sort of best practices and, and really share experiences across the membership. Yeah, thank you everyone. Okay. Thanks everyone. Also too, if you, uh, my, my colleague Jamal, oh, Jamal posted a sort of link to a survey in the chat. Um, if you have a moment and can fill it out, that would be greatly appreciated. We do take your feedback very much so into consideration as we build out our future programming. Thank you, Paul. Thank you to the CW team as well. Yeah, thanks. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.